it is being recorded. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so first of all, I would like to start with Ukrainian. Yes. <laughs> So I would like to start with Ukrainian. I just wanted to remind you that we're going to have the simultaneous interpretation provided. And if you do not understand English, then it's better to choose Ukrainian in the interpretation. Please choose the interpretation underneath your screen uh, for English. That will be really easier for you. Uh, and then we can proceed, we can move on. So today I would like to, first of all, congratulate everybody on the World Water Day, uh, which is today. And uh, well, against all odds, we, we still continue and we still uh, try to do our best to move uh, Ukraine's rebuild and modernization forward uh, in a circular way. But also, uh, you know, this morning I heard over the radio that uh, it is only 94 um, million cubic meters of water uh 94 cubic kilometers of water is left in ukraine so we have to manage these water resources in a smart way and uh, well basically uh, this uh, webinar is dedicated to enabling safe drinking water for all uh how to do that in ukrainian cities after the war uh, is the the key question and today we have uh, TU Delft uh, with us, uh, Luke Ritfeld. We have Waternet on the grammar. Uh, and we are happy that uh, again and again, uh, the embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Kiev is supporting our initiative and uh, keeps believing in our efforts to modernize and, uh, yeah, rebuild Ukraine in a better, greener, circular, and more inclusive way. In 2021, we have launched a small project here in Kyiv. It's, it's called uh, Free Water Refill, where we involved dozens of cafes, uh, restaurants, and hubs uh, that agreed to uh, refill your bottle uh, for free. Uh, it has also interactive map, etc. So when it's hot in Kyiv and you're a pedestrian willing to drink some water, you can just pop up uh to one of these uh, places and, and and get your water for free but this is a tiny 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 thing in uh this uh, ocean of uh, our issues problems that we have in ukraine with uh, drinkable water from tap at our homes offices etc uh but without further ado i would like to give the floor to ira eisenbrand uh the secretary of the embassy of the netherlands in kiev uh, I am gratitude for supporting this event today, and uh, please, the floor is yours for a short intro. Thank you so much, uh, Roman. Dobrovaranku, vitaju vas. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, uh, also welcome from uh, from my side for uh, uh, to the webinar today. Uh, as the embassy, we're very happy to support another uh, initiative of the Kiev City Administration together with, uh, with Rethink on uh, the series of uh, educative events on water topics. And uh, indeed, no better timing than today, because today is uh, World Water Day. So uh, uh, perfect timing in that sense. I think for a lot of people, especially if I look uh, also to the Netherlands, clean drinking water is something that we take for granted. Uh, I also took for granted that electricity is there, but living in, in, in Kiev, uh, showing, seeing the Russian aggression, we realized that a lot of these things are not uh, to be taken for granted. And the same goes for, for drinking water. Um, all around the world, we see that uh, the harsh climate uh, uh, destroys uh, people's access to clean drinking water, but also in the case of Ukraine specifically, we see that uh, Russian aggression has also destroyed this. According to uh, UN reports, the number of people in need of access to safe drinking water has increased a lot in Ukraine, almost, well, more than double, sorry, I should say. Between April and December 2022, it increased from 6 to 16 million 
showing that uh, the need of access to clean drinking water and safe water is very high. And of course, this has a big impact on people's daily life, on their health, uh, but it also just simply violates their right to safe and clean drinking water. We see that water is a very important resource uh, for sustainable development as well. Water resources and the range of services they provide underpin poverty reduction, economic growth, and also environmental sustainability. It, in, it contributes, sorry, end of the air raid uh, alarm. Um, sorry, I just very quickly need to let my security manager know where I am. Sorry, otherwise he is going to call me. No, yes. that's just a great illustration of Ukrainian reality every day. Exactly. Uh, already told told no, that we had iron siren. So, yeah, yes, good that it's uh, now off. Yes, indeed. Um, sorry, colleagues. Let me let me continue. Um, and therefore, yeah, as I was saying, water is a very important resource also for environmental sustainability, for social be well-being, for inclusive growth, and it, in it affects a lot of uh, people worldwide. Drinking water and access to it is therefore really considered to be a global challenge. And we, uh, as the embassy, as we have shown with, with a lot of the, the initiatives that we have supported, think that teaming up and exchanging experiences together is of the utmost value and will also contribute uh, at least in small parts to to solving the challenge well as the netherlands uh, it comes to no surprise that we have accumulated a lot of knowledge uh, regarding water and i would say that the dutch view uh, and Dutch experience with water really seeks to strike a balance between economic and social welfare without compromising the sustainability of ecosystems that are vital to, to, our, to our country and to our planet. Um, and today uh, I'm very happy that uh, we actively support and stimulate the knowledge exchange uh, and happy to present to you the two leading uh, uh, Dutch experts. Uh, you already introduced them a little bit, Roman, but very happy to have you here. Onno Kramer from Waternet and Luc Rietveld from uh, Technical University Delft. And I really hope for all the participants today that uh, uh, your, the session that we organized today is useful for you, will give you inspiration and will contribute to uh, your work and to solving local water challenges. So thank you all for uh, for joining us today. I hope it's a fruitful uh, session. And uh, last but definitely not least, Slavo Krim. Hello, I'm Slavo. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> not much to add. Uh, basically, so without further, well, uh, uh, one thing uh, we we still uh, were supposed to have Alexander Wozny from the Kyiv city administration, uh, he is the head of uh, environment uh, department, but uh, I was informed that he has a very important overlap. Uh, I don't know if, it, if it's related to the siren or maybe smog in Kyiv, but uh, still he is not able to join, uh, which is pity, but still we continue. And without further ado, I give the floor to Luke Ritfeld from uh, TU Delft. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Please, the floor is yours. You can share your slides. But you are muted now. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's yes, great. Okay. Yes, okay. Shall I start? Thank you very much for the invitation to talk about drinking water supply in the Netherlands. And uh, Ono will uh, zoom in to more specific part. I cannot say a lot in a half an hour, let's say, but it is more a sneak, sneak preview on uh, what is happening in the Netherlands and uh, hope Hopefully, this can be the start of a more uh, wider collaboration uh, between Ukraine and the Netherlands, and specifically the TU Delft. So I'm uh, going to talk uh, about uh, the water supply, the setup of the water supply in the Netherlands. And the most particular part is that we don't use chlorine 
for drink in the drinking water supply. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will explain during this uh, this half an hour how that comes and um, and uh, how useful that is, and maybe that is an inspiration uh, for you as well for the future. Uh, let me see. So uh, yeah, as an inspiration, uh, when I was a young uh, boy, I lived in the, the city of Wageningen and um, along the River Rhine, a very big river that was in the 70s, uh, very much polluted. Uh, there were no fish in the river. Um, you could hardly make any drinking water out of it. And uh, when you went to the coast, uh, my, my grandparents lived in The Hague, the, the, one of the capitals of the Netherlands, and the drinking water was really bad. Uh, tea, having tea with your parents was really uh, uh, not, not, not an, uh, an, 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 a nice uh, moment. So uh, at that time, uh, in the Netherlands, we decided to change things. And one of the things they said, we want to have the salmon back in the River Rhine. Uh, because, uh, not because we want to increase fishing in the River Rhine with salmon, but a salmon is an indicator that the River Rhine will be clean and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, clean. Um, the same uh, happened with uh, the drinking water at that time. At that, in the 70s, more or less, we decided that yeah, the drinking water that we have uh, should be drinkable from, uh, from the tap. And um, that is important, of course, because uh, drinking water, as we all know, it is, um, um, it is uh, for health. The best uh, health, health uh, system that you have is the drinking water and sanitation system. And that you can see, for example, in the Netherlands, in the past, there were a lot of deaths because of typh uh, typhoid fever and all type of other uh, uh, diseases, of course. Um, for example, in uh, the beginning of last century, uh, there were about 70 uh, people per 100,000 inhabitants that died from typhoid fever. But with the increase of the connection of, uh, to the drinking central drinking water supply, this uh, this number uh, went down until zero, and uh, so not only that is just an indication, but also diarrhea, etc., all disappeared, and now uh, we we don't have any diseases or uh, only a few diseases because of water supply and sanitation, and uh, therefore. Um, um, and that is because of the very good quality of the water that we have from the tap. And we can see that in this, uh, this slide, in the Netherlands, we don't sell uh, water from bottles, or at least compared to other countries in Europe, Italy, France, Belgium, there people uh, buy bottles uh, from, uh, uh, from shops, uh, they drink it from uh, bottles, and in the Netherlands, we hardly do that because we can drink the water straight from the tap. And there is no need for filtration, even uh, at, at home, uh, even it is not, um, uh, um, it, it, it is not wanted because if you have uh, filters, maybe you can have regrowth of bacteria in your filters and the water quality even goes down. So we can drink it straight from the tap and uh, later I will explain what is the benefit uh, from this. Um, so our water supply from the 70s until now grew to a system that we call the miracle from the tap. Uh, there is, uh, it's free uh, of uh, pathogenic microorganisms. There are no micropollutants in the water. Uh, we don't have the water is soft eh, or not too hard. There's no corrosion of the drink of the supply system. There are no leakages, maybe one, two percent, but compared to many other uh, parts in the world, this is really uh, low. And we don't waste uh, water, and what we said, we don't, uh, there's no need for home filters, even uh, that is not wanted, and we don't use uh, chlorine. Um, now, why we don't use chlorine? Uh, on the one hand, because 
chlorine is not tasteful. Uh, if you drink water with chlorine from the tap, you prefer to drink water from a bottle because uh, you, you smell and taste the chlorine. There's another aspect that chlorine is also not good for the quality of the water. And in 1973 or 1974, uh, a Dutch uh, person from the uh, Rotterdam water supply, Joop Rook, he discovered that there is the formation of three halomethanes, like chloroform, that is formed uh, by adding chlorine to uh, to uh, treated river water or treated groundwater. So uh, this is bad for health. Eh? It's carcinogenic. So you don't want to have three halomethanes in your water. Now, uh, during that period, uh, there were two uh, streams, let's say. Some said, okay, let me try to diminish the three halomethanes by removing organic material from the water or diminishing the chlorine. In the Netherlands, we said, no, we don't want to do that. We want to, to get rid of the, the, the three halomethanes and we want to abolish uh, the chlorine. And that, uh, and that happened. Um, so uh, gradually uh, from, night, from the 80s, we went down with the chlorine concentration until uh, zero in uh, at Waternet in 1983, and um, so that that is uh, in principle good for the quality of the water, but chlorine also has its uh, advantages uh, because if you dose chlorine, you have disinfection on the one hand, but also there's a residual in the distribution network. So if you have recontamination then uh, chlorine can uh, kill this, uh, these bacteria. And uh, so that's, um, uh, that's why uh, uh, we, we uh, have to, we had to rethink uh, our whole system. And um, yeah, I will explain that a little bit to, to you. So to give a little bit of a background, um, in the Netherlands, we have two thirds of our water comes from groundwater. And one third comes from uh, service water, like the River Rhine, River Meuse, and um, and others. And um, yeah, with with regard to the treatment, of course, groundwater is normally simple simple to treat. Uh, so you have an aeration and a sand filtration, and then you can get rid of your iron, manganese, ammonia. You aerate it with uh, oxygen, and then in principle, you have good water. Although nowadays. Uh, because of the heavy pollutions with pesticides and industrial pollutions, also groundwater is uh, being contaminated nowadays. So we have to increase the treatment there as well. But okay, in principle, it can be easy uh, easy to treat. Service water is more difficult because to get to make from service water drinking water, yeah, you need extensive treatment, and I will come to that later. Um, so and then. Uh, what is important that when you distribute this water, that you don't have leakage, because of course you don't want to uh, spoil uh, water that is heavily treated and transported. But also, when you have leakage, it can happen that there can be recontamination of your uh, water when the pressure goes down. And so then you can have, for example, when the pressure in the drinking water uh, network goes down. You can have ingression of um, of more uh, than groundwater that is polluted. So uh, you don't want to have leakage. You want to have your system always on the, in the pressure. And yeah, uh, we don't want to have chlorine, but that also means that we need this extensive treatment. I come back to that later. So the infra the infrastructure, the underground infrastructure, is in fact the most important. Where you have to start is to have in, in, in the system that is uh, not leaking, always under pressure, and uh, and when you uh, when you change uh, pipes, you have to do that very hygienically to avoid that during operation and, and maintenance that uh, bacteria can come into this uh, into the system, and it's not easy because there are many pipes. And that's not only drinking water, there's also sewerage, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this is the, the first uh, part where, where we have to think of. And, and then uh, we have to avoid 
that there is also other possibilities of ingression of uh, of water from outside. For example, uh, yeah, if we have pipes uh, that are in, in flooding areas and these pipes are not uh, pressurized and they have leakages, then uh, there can be ingression of surface water that pollutes uh, the water. Also, when you have uh, fire, uh, when you are firefighting, uh, be careful eh, that there's not a possibility that uh, water from outside can go into the, the system. That happened uh, a few years ago, I know, in, in Belgium, where they were pumping, uh, yeah, during a firefighting event, uh, they were pumping uh, surface water into the distribution network. So we have to avoid this type of things, always avoid back siphoning, as we call it. So, um, um, Distribution is the first part. If we do that in the, in the right way, uh, and we can, for example, forecast where are the bursts so that we can repair immediately uh, these, uh, these bursts to avoid the leakage and to go down with, uh, with the pressures, then uh, we can maintain our water uh, very well. Now, another thing is what is very important is that we have to avoid that there is regrowth in our distribution network because we don't have chlorine uh, the chlorine uh, cannot attack the biofilm so we have to avoid growth of biofilm in the distribution network and that is only possible when we have a treatment that not only removes all the bacteria and viruses etc but also the nutrients to avoid that uh, biofilms can grow and the nutrients can be organic material, can be uh, phosphates, for example, that has to be to a very low level so that there is no regrowth. And there is a lot of research done in the 70s, 80s, uh, especially by uh, Professor van der Kooi, who, uh, who developed all type of uh, methods to, to measure what is the regrowth potential in, uh, in, uh, in distribution networks. Um, of course, this does not mean that when uh, when we have such a system, it is a, it is always like this. Uh, uh, there is also uh, yeah uh, changes going up going up. Uh, for example, in one of the uh, companies in the Netherlands, they wanted to switch from the one from the one uh, source to another source, and then they had to uh, uh, find out whether that this change would not mean that biofilms could start growing again and so it's a dynamic system that we have to uh, check all the time and here's some uh, research was done also with oas and one of the water companies in the qdl uh, another thing is of course uh, if if we uh, use the drinking water supply for other purposes uh, we also have to see whether there are uh, possibilities for regrowth again in this case uh, for example, uh, we, uh, they wanted to uh, use the, the drinking water supply for um, a cooling and um, a blood bank. And, uh, and when you cool, uh, you use the cold in the, in the drinking water, of course, you're heating up your water a little bit. And if you heat up your, your distribution uh, network a little bit, then maybe the biofilms can grow again. So a lot of effort should be uh, should be uh, made to avoid this type of uh, uh, biofilm growth and to check whether, for example, heating up your system can uh, can give this type of uh, of uh, uh, biofilm growth. So uh, so we have to look uh, in our system mainly to uh, to integrity uh, to see how we can avoid all type of recontamination, um, uh, regrowth, etc. And that we have codes, um, hygiene codes, for example, uh, during construction, maintenance, repairs, that there is no, uh, never a contamination of our, of, of our water supply. So uh, until now, uh, we, 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 we have now during 50 years, more or less, this, uh, this system without chlorine, and of course, we, we, we made all type of risk analyses to see how good uh, everything is functioning. 
Now, and, and what came out eh, that there is always a risk for recontamination. You never know. And if there is recontamination, yeah, the, the effect is uh, is really uh, it's really big. So we have to be aware that in the moment that there is recontamination, that we immediately inform everyone. But until now, there are, there were not this type of uh, outbreaks. And when you compare it to other systems, for example, in France, where they use chlorination, uh, our contamination level is much lower than uh, the contamination in, in France. And that also has to do with the fact that our distribution is so, so well organized, low leakage, uh, no interruptions, et cetera, no negative pressures, no low pressures, so no recontamination from, uh, from outside. So um, distribution is one thing. And of course, we also need perfect drinking water coming into the distribution. And this perfect uh, drinking water that can only be made by, uh, yeah, uh, from, from service or from groundwater or from service water. Now, what I said, one third is uh, service water in the Netherlands. And what we do then is the following. Yeah? We take water normally from, uh, in this case, uh, for Amsterdam, The Hague, and, and other parts in uh, the western part of the Netherlands. We take water from the river, then we pre-treat it water with coagulation, sedimentation, filtration, and then, and that is normally a conventional treatment plant uh, in other parts of the world. Then, but for us, this is just pre-treatment. And then we distribute it to, for example, the dune areas. We infiltrate it in the dune areas. The water stays for 80 days or 60 days, maybe 90 days in the underground. And then it is pumped again. And then it has a substantial treatment with, in this case, ozone, um, softening, activated carbon, slow sand filtration, et cetera, to make perfect drinking water out of it. So this is one of the systems that we need to, on the one hand, remove all the pathogens that are in the water, all the micropollutants that are in the water, also make it softer to, uh, for, for better appreciation, and uh, also to take out the nutrients to avoid biofilm growth in our distribution network. Uh, this is an alternative uh, system. Here, we don't have the, the pretreatment, but what we do is we, uh, we have a well just next to the river. And the pretreatment now is uh, the subsoil uh, uh, in, the, in the riverbank. So the water is pumped and therefore attracts the river, but the water, the river water uh, flows through the sand layers to uh, the well. So we have a pretreatment already, and then we have another treatment with aeration, filtration, activated carbon, and also the softening to, uh, to make this drinking water out of it. Now, and, and, and uh, the last part is, of course, you can also have a direct treatment of our, your surface waters, and, that, and then we use, uh, let's say, uh, pretreatment, reservoirs, uh, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and then to uh, have uh, your disinfection and your removal of organic micropollutants, we have ozonation and activated uh, carbon filtration. Uh, here, a very low concentration of uh, uh, chlorine dioxide is used only to, uh, uh, to avoid that there is this uh, slight biofilm uh, growth, but it is hardly uh, anything. Uh, nowadays, we are more moving uh, to other uh, uh, treatment systems, uh, for example, using uh, um, membrane filtration, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, uh, also UV uh, disinfection and still activated carbon filtration to remove your micropollutants, to remove all your pathogens and uh, to make it uh, soft and, uh, and attractive. Um, so in the Netherlands, uh, we, we uh, abolish the chlorine, but of course we have alternative disinfection in our drinking water uh, supply uh, treatment systems. 
And for example, we have this artificial recharge of our dune area of our riverbank. During dune passage, you already have the degradation of your uh, micro of your microorganisms. Uh, and then in the post treatment, we have ozone, uh, slow sand filtration, also a disinfect a disinfection system, and uh, UV uh, and UV peroxide is nowadays also implemented during uh, direct uh, treatment. And of course, our membrane uh, filters also can uh, remove the bacteria and uh, the viruses. So here you see one of the, uh, the new systems that are built nowadays. It is, uh, we call it a, a one-step reverse osmosis, membrane filtration that can uh, remove the pathogens, but also the organic micropollutants and can soften the water so uh, we are moving from the conventional treatment more to the, uh, to the more advanced uh, treatment uh, system. This is, by the way, a system that uh, uses uh, riverbank filtrate. Now, I already mentioned the softening. Uh, Ono will talk a little bit more about softening because WaterNet is really uh, into softening, I think, and they also do a lot with reuse. But uh, the most important part, and I wanted to show that, is that softened, softened water is, of course, very good for, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, yeah, appreciation. What I said in the beginning, you don't want to drink tea uh, with hard water, but also you use less soap when you have soft water and uh, you don't have... Uh, uh, scaling of your uh, heating devices like your coffee machines and your washing machines, etc. So the softening process is really cheap. So, uh, but the benefits for the client are really high. So it always uh, pays back. So that's why we invest also in in softening in uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, nowadays we are also moving uh, uh, to other type of uh, treatment systems where we say, okay. To make, for example, the absorption of organic micropollutants by activated carbon more efficient, maybe we invest in the pretreatment, like um, uh, the removal of natural organic matter that makes the activated carbon uh, more effective. That's uh, one of the, the res uh, researches that were done by Watt and has not implemented, uh, I think. But in other companies, they are now implementing this type of uh, systems where they have uh, ion exchange and, and also membranes for a good pretreatment and to make the UV and the activated carbon filters uh, more efficient. And you can, of course, think of more combinations because at the end, what we want to do is to have the perfect uh, drinking water that is, uh, that is uh, like the miracle from the tap, but without the nutrients and without all the Micropollutants, organic uh, uh, microorganisms, and uh, etc. Uh, of course, when you do so, you also have to control your system well. And um, yeah, at the TU Delft, we we, ha we have uh, done some research on this. Uh, ono was also part of uh, of uh, the softening uh, in this in this sense. So um, I think uh, you can invest, of course, in installations, but you also should. Uh, invest in uh, good operation and maintenance uh, schedules so that your system is always operating at the right, uh, at the right uh, spot. So when you do this, you can make uh, water that is, uh, that is perfect and can be uh, drunk from, uh, from the tap. And uh, that's why uh, uh, for me, it, it is like um, for, for uh, a system without chlorine, is like the salmon in the river Rhine. Yeah? Uh, you want to have a system without chlorine because when your system is uh, non-chlorinated, that means that you have perfect uh, treatment and a very good distribution uh, system. But then always the question is, is this feasible? Uh, is this feasible? Uh, because you can say, okay, the Netherlands, we are rich, we pay a lot and uh, is that feasible for uh, other countries like Ukraine or uh, uh, elsewhere in Europe? Now, and, and that's why I wanted to, uh, to show you uh, this slide. Eh? Um, 
uh, when you buy a bottle of water, maybe that is 50 cents of a euro. Imagine that you cannot drink your water directly from the tap. Then you have to buy a bottle to drink. And that is 50 cents. Then the question is, how much do you pay for drinking water that comes from the tap? Now, in the Netherlands, we use more or less 125 liters uh, per person per day. And we use that for everything. For the kitchen, from, for baths, showers, washing, garden, toilets, drinking, everything. 125 liters. The price of the water is maybe one and a half euro per thousand liters. So that means 18 cents per person per day. So when you invest in this perfect water, where you uh, that that is no uh, distributed without leakages, without recontamination, without regrowth, it is much cheaper for the people to have uh, this type of water than to have bad water quality that cannot be drunk from the tap, and then you have to buy a bottle. So uh, in not investing in perfect drinking water supply is in fact uh, bad for yeah the clients eh, the consumers the customers so this is uh, yeah let's say a sneak preview about what is the uh, what is the water supply situation in the netherlands if you want to know more of course we can always uh, uh, talk later thank you for your attention thank you very much look uh, indeed uh, there are already some questions uh, and please uh, i urge everyone to put your questions into the Q and A, um, we will discuss them in the end uh, with the Q and A session. But thank you very much; it was okay. very interesting. And besides, uh, of course, besides uh, the economic sustainability part, uh, there is also a packaging issue. So, uh, if you have to buy water, you, you're uh, misusing uh, PET plastics, which is normally downcycled. Uh, I, I did not talk about the environmental impact. You're totally right. Uh, that's yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's uh, it's the main well one of the main issues as well. If you consider also environmental sustainability of tap water, so it's uh, really worth investing. Uh, we move on, and uh, now we will have Ono Kramer from Waternet to speak about uh, specific. Uh, operations in yeah ensuring uh, tap water as a safe drinking water in Amsterdam area. Please, or no. Do you hear me, Roman? Yes, it's great. We can hear you and we see the slides. Yeah. Thank you. Dobre Horanko, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Luke, for your wonderful presentation about water treatment. And I'm really honored to be a speaker at this webinar. And I'm really delighted to share some information about water purification in Amsterdam at Waternet. I prepared the following presentation for you with the following topics. I will tell you a little bit about the water cycle company Waternet in Amsterdam. I will discuss a little bit the treatment steps and the purification. Then I will address briefly the sustainability goals. And really important is my, I will share some experience about how to design a new drinking water treatment plant. And I will end up with some recommendations from my side to Ocarine. So. I work quite a while now for Waternet as a process technologist, but I do it in close co collaboration with many universities, with Professor Ritveld from the TU Delft, uh, the Applied University in Utrecht, and as well as Queen Mary, Mary University of London. And you see here nice, beautiful pictures of the water activities in Amsterdam and surroundings. And Waternet is in charge of many water activities like drinking water production and distribution to the customers, wastewater collection and treatment, and as well, surface water management, for instance, 
flood protection and uh, ship management, uh, dike inspections. Uh, and in fact, WaterNet is a water cycle organization. We're responsible for drinking water, wastewater, and surface water management. And we have core values, such as economic efficiency, experience, customer orientation, so happy clients, and of course, nowadays, more sustainability goals. But WaterNet was, was started in the 19th century, and there, for public health reasons, we started building the first first uh, tubes from to Amsterdam. And so supply was very, very important, but increasingly water quality became important and the comfort of the clients, as Luke already said, so safety. And, but resource recovery, sustainability goals were not originally included in the design criteria. So that's quite a challenge for an organization that is quite old. So, and, Already Luke mentioned this. Uh, in the Netherlands in general, we try to prevent the doses of chlorine. And why? Because uh, it can form disinfection byproducts, already mentioned by Luke Rietveld, three halomethanes, but can be suspected carcinogenic on the lifetime exposure. But sometimes when your system is not really reliable, you have to do this. So you can read it in this uh, science journal article in the right, right corner. But our policy is to deliver and to produce biological stable water. And they have to meet three criteria in that case. Starting with source protection is really important. Reliable and sustainable sources. After that, an advanced treatment plant and the distribution network, the infrastructure should be reliable, so the integrity of your system is also really decisive for your water quality. And our philosophy is multi barriers for harmful constituents in your water that can, can be harmful pathogens that makes you really sick, but also organic micro pollutants like pesticides, hormones, and also even PFAS. This all pair flu all kinds of substances are quite a challenge for mankind. So we'll try to produce biological stable water without the reduction of grow factors, you know, the nutrients as Luke already mentions, and softening. And if you respect your distribution networks, and that's quite an investment, then you can prevent the, 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 the doses for chlorine. And you have need online and offline and laboratory measurements to control your water, you check your water quality. And sustainability goals are also becoming more relevant in nowadays. And for all new kinds of challenges, we also work together with research scientists in an advanced pilot plans. So at the top, you see a schematic overview of how we treat our water. And some were already mentioned by Professor Rietveld. You start, of course, with your source. After that, an again conventional pretreatment go collation, flock formation, so algae, healthy metals, and just large sus uh, suspended solids are removed from the water, also using the most applied process, filtration. And really important in this sense is your strate strategic buffer for several months or a dune or a lake or in the or air in your soil. But it's important for situations when there's scarcity. After that, the water is distributed to the main treatment plants. And therefore, we started with ozonation, a strong oxidator to convert organic micro pollutions like pesticides, hormones, medicine remains, and so on. But that's softening, I will address that later. And a really crucial process is granular activated carbon filtration. To give you an idea, if you take one gram of granular particles of carbon, it is equivalent to one soccer field service area. So that's quite a lot. So if you have three meters, for instance, of a filter filled with granular activated carbon, you can imagine that many micropollutants will be removed through adsorption from your water. And a very crucial process in our treatment train is slow sand filtration. 
very fine sand where the remaining fine particles are removed from the water and as well when the disinfection capacity is really high. So I call that nature-based solutions. So that's the way our conventional treatment plant and processes are um, com consistent. Um, next topic is, I will address that briefly, is about sustainability goals. But I understood that in previous webinar already, wastewater was uh, the, the topic. So I will take not too much time for this topic, but you can imagine that in Europe, also on this planet, but also in the Netherlands and the city of Amsterdam, they have sustainability goals. So in 2050, zero waste policy and climate neutral. And that's quite a challenge. So to make that a bit more concrete for water engineers and for suppliers, yes, you have to rephrase your strategic goals into more concrete things you can do. So a particular case, if you design your treatment plan in such a way, you can reduce chemicals and also save energy and reuse your precious material, materials. So this is a long list about activities we apply in the complete water cycle. So not only drinking water, also wastewater and surface water. Examples are thermal heat exchange. It's also quite a challenge already mentioned by Luke, but you can uh, prevent clogging in your system by removing struvite, what can we use as fertilizer, cellulose, bioplastics, and so on. And metal salts can also be removed and reused from the water cycle. And I'll give you a nice example. Water is normally quite hard and you can reduce the hardness through several systems. For instance, membranes or ion exchange, but also through crystallization. And that's what we do here in Amsterdam and also other, other water suppliers. Therefore, we use uh, seeded crystallization in fluidized bed reactors. And you can see this like this. It's a, a high reactor filled with seeding grains, for instance, sand, and the calcium is removed from the water through a dosage of a strong base. And then you form small particles called calcite pellets. And we did it for 30 years and we produce a lot of waste. And that's not sustainable. That does not meet our criteria. So through a lot of innovation and education and, and, and assignments, we could change this linear system with a lot of waste to a more circular system. So we purchased the seeding grains from Australia, shipped it to the Netherlands, and then we produce this waste. But we could reuse these calcite granules as a seeding material for, uh, for the input. So we have a more circular process. And from the re remaining calcite pellets, <coughs> excuse me, you could valorize that and convert it to glass, paper, cosmetics, and so on. So that's an example how you can converge your old processes into more modern circular processes. And that's makes a contribution to our sustainability goals. And this can only be done because we worked in close collaboration with many universities. I had, was a supervisor for approximately 125 students and many came from the TU Delft. And we address a practical challenge. We translate it into a research assignment and through education and, and graduation projects as a water supplier, we have answers to solutions. University has more scientific impact, and the students have a, a prosperous perspective on a job. And that's really the synergy of working in the field of practice, research, education um, for the water suppliers. And you see on the, on the left several topics, but there are, of course, many more. So this is a really special topic for me. Because many decades, I was always wondering, how should you design a drinking water treatment plant from scratch? Most very wise engineers and professors say, you start mostly based on your um, existing plants. But for me, I was wondering, but then also old mistakes are still apparent in your system. And my opinion was, can you change that? So this simple slide addresses my opinion about how you should design a drinking water treatment plant. So it starts, of course, finding with a reliable source. 
It can be or a lake or a ground or a river, but your source must be reliable. And it, that is the basis of your water quality because you have to cope with the guidelines at the end in the right corner below because citizens should, in my opinion, drink reliable and tasty drinking water from the tap. And as Luke already mentioned, without the taste of chlorine. So you start with your source and then you have to meet a lot of multi criteria and that's a long list and it's really complicated, such as water quality, your supply, your cost price, and then also many sustainability goals, but also scarcity. If you purchase membranes, you have to wait for approximately a year that they come to your site. And if you purchase, if you use iron exchange resin, you have to wait for sometimes one and a half year. So scarcity is also a criteria you have to take in close color, uh, consideration. But there's more. There's also innovation and, and the, 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 the level of skills of the, of the professionals. So that's really hard. But if you make your choices as, as, as a lever motion between all the criteria, and then you come up with the selection of your unit operations. For instance, if you, you choose a conventional treatment plant, as Professor Ritford already mentioned, or more modern using membranes or UF or ion exchange or other, <coughs> excuse me, other techniques. You have to build your, 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 your whole sequence of all these unit operations. And it's also quite a challenge. And if you make your design, then you have to meet other external factors, such as policy, such as water stress, such as guidelines, and, and, and many factors that are really important and affect your design eventually. So, and then your health treatment plant is also related to the energy nexus and to the material, to material cycles. So, and then we are back to the source. And this is, of course, a cycle. In my opinion, when you start to design a plant existing or from scratch, then you should run several times through this cycle. And, and every time you increase your design a bit more in detail, so you end up with a good system. This is the way I, I would do it now. And I'll wrap up with some recommendations from my side. And it feels a bit awkward because I am here in a safe country without war, but I do my best to give you some advice from my side. So Roman already mentioned, it's a massive journey to start and to deliver water for all the people in Ukraine. And I realized that. So, but let's focus on and have a dream about reliable drinking water from the tap for everyone. So we have to make many decisions, of course. And I would say, try to think big. And this addresses what I think. So there are many success factors you can apply to be able to, to design your drinking water treatment plant. So in the city of Amsterdam, the water supplies always, when they build, they, they um, are in close collaboration with the other utilities, for instance, the energy, or perhaps even internet. So work together, work, that's synergy. But as well with your planning, perhaps it's not um, reachable that you start uh, with a different, uh, with a modular approach. Suppose you could produce water, but that does not require the cope with the guidelines, but you can later on increase the quality and so continuously improving your site. Yeah, reliable source financial situation, also really important, find sustainable, sustainable investors. And then the integrated water management. And so also working in the water cycle. So not only drinking water, but also wastewater and surface water. And the, the, the last topic, operational efficiency and customer satisfaction. The clients also have an opinion. So be in close contact with your customers, the citizens. So, and then the technical, of course, the technical solutions. You have to decide conventional, more advanced. I prefer nature-based solutions, right? And then, of course, always check your water quality using smart sensors. And there so comes innovation also pop up. Then work from the water cycle and also try to close loops. And research can be done in pilot plants. So the level of knowledge is also really important. And it's a bit my 
my thing, education, training young people, training people to be to work in this beautiful field of water so we can help building water cycle and water treatment facilities. Um, yeah, exchange also possible and, and many other things. So I will wrap up with, this is my motto, safe and tasty drinking water for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ono. Uh, thank you all. It's uh, really inspiring. A lot of recommendations in the end. Uh, many of them require lots of money and investment, which uh, Ukrainians obviously do not possess right now. But we hope that gradually after the war, it will be possible. But uh, we could also start from training and exchange. And I believe that after the war, we could probably organize some missions to the Netherlands and to really learn from you and to visit some of the facilities but let's let's see let's see how it goes uh um, more welcome yes uh, one technical uh comment uh your we can see you but it's uh, like all blurred now maybe you have switched on some blurring mode or something uh it's not like the biggest issue but just in case if you can come back to normal sharpness it would be okay but otherwise, we will move on with the questions and discussion. There are quite some of them uh, already. I will be just uh, running them in the sequence they were asked. So no, no preference to anybody. Uh, first question comes about uh, fields of expertise. Uh, which fields of expertise need to come together to achieve sustainable, safe drinking water? So I guess it's about uh, what kind of people do you have to have in your local water facility? Maybe it's question to look first and then... Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. It's, yeah, it's it, is, uh, it is a good question, I think, uh, because um, uh, yeah, drinking water supply is really multidisciplinary and uh, you need many different uh, fields of expertise. For example, if it comes to treatment, uh, normally uh, in the Netherlands, uh, drinking water treatment and supply is uh, done by civil engineers, uh, but you can also have chemical, uh, chemical engineers uh, for the treatment. Um, if it comes to um, microbial uh, parts, uh, um, regrowth in distribution networks, the uh, microbiologists come in. Uh, we have, of course, uh, people who control the water quality. Uh, therefore, we need analytic uh, chemistry. Uh, so uh, there are many, uh, many different fields of expertise that come together. Uh, mechanical engineers for the pumps and uh, uh, and the pipes, electrical uh, engineers uh, for also for the pumps and, and all type of devices. But nowadays also control engineers uh, that need to control uh, the whole system, optimize the system. Uh, nowadays we have more and more sensors in our systems. So these data have to be analyzed and, and, and also something has to be done with this data. Uh, we have asset managers uh, for the infrastructure, so we are, it is a complex uh, mixture of all type of uh, expertise that we uh, that we need. But uh, yeah, uh, it, originally I think it comes from the civil engineering part eh, because it has to do with uh, infrastructure. But uh, yeah, uh, we work in teams in, in many multidisciplinary teams. So, so maybe Arno, from your experience, you can also. Uh, add something uh, on this. Sorry, I was a yeah. tiny bit uh, uh, removed from the system. So I didn't hear you, Luke. I only heard okay. my name. So sorry for that. OK, no problem. Uh, Perhaps next easy. question. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, next it's question. Just, uh... <laughs> sorry. That is clear for you, yeah. Thank you very much. It's quite an extensive answer, but Luke said that um, you, you might be willing to add something uh, on, on that question, if you like. Yeah, I'm so sorry, about, I couldn't uh, hear the that. question sorry. was, what type of disciplines do we need or no, uh, for making water supply sustainable? And I explained that it is a mixture of many different, uh, of many different uh, specialisms uh, like chemistry, civil engineering, uh, chemical engineering, bio, uh, microbiology, uh, 
chemical analysts, uh, even asset managers, uh, control engineers, et cetera, et cetera. So yes. it is really a mixture of all type of different yeah. uh, expertise. I completely agree. But if you zoom out, it's you should focus on the long-term investments. I'll give you one bit, a perhaps silly example. In 1853, we built our first tube from iron from the coastal area, from the dune area, where the water was infiltrated to the city of Amsterdam. And you won't believe it, but this pipe still exists. And in fact, that's asset management pure sung in the Dutch. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so it means this really well. This is a pure asset management. You make some investments and it, is, it exists already for more than 150 years. So if you design a, 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 um, a treatment plant with the scope on sustainability, then in my opinion, you should try to avoid chemicals as much as possible. You have to imagine, I'm a chemical engineer, so you know who is this uh, telling you this narrative. But try to avoid chemicals. And, and, and uh, nature-based solutions are a go good solution for that. So Luke already mentioned that, perhaps riverbank filtration. You have, in fact, some kind of filter for free, right? You need energy. But that can be solved perhaps using perhaps solar panels or, or cheap engines that are oh, and so on. But the long term focus would be, in my opinion, the best advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's a, yeah, it's a great example, and it's really relates to yeah, it, it relates to uh, one of the next questions. But uh, first, uh, the next one would be. Uh, what do you think about freezing uh, process water purification technology? So when the water is frozen to ice and then uh, melts again, and yeah. then you remove something which is in the middle of the ice. Yeah, the point is um, this is one of the of the uh, alternatives for desalination. Eh? Um, so if you don't have, uh, let let me first say if you don't have uh, fresh water then you have to go to alternative sources. And uh, so first we normally go to the fresh sources like groundwater, fresh groundwater and fresh surface water. And uh, normally this, uh, uh, this water is sufficient, especially uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Central Europe. I think uh, there should be sufficient water to make uh, household water out of that. Uh, in uh, special cases where there are no, where there is no fresh groundwater or surface water, then we have to run to other other types of sources. Um, uh, we preferably then do uh, the following: that we say, okay, uh, we have competitors. Eh? We have uh, uh, domestic supply, but also industry and agriculture, and especially industry, they use a lot of water too. And maybe they don't need the best uh, water supply, uh, water sources. So maybe we can uh, say to the industry, uh, maybe we can treat our wastewater uh, up to the standard that the industry can use. And then we have more water available, fresh water for the domestic supply. So all this type of management we have to do first. And then when nothing is, uh, is uh, in place anymore, then we have to go to uh, desalination. Uh, so uh, uh, salt water, practice water that we have to desalinate. And in the in the Netherlands, we normally use um, a reverse osmosis for that membranes, because uh, yeah, they are well established. Uh, the energy consumption is low, etc. Uh, and then uh, you have, uh, but then the problem is that with desalination, you what you do, you have two membranes, or you have a membrane, and you make two streams a fresh water stream and a very concentrated stream, the concentrate. We call that brine. And this brine, you have to, you have to discharge. And this is difficult eh? because, uh, yeah, the, 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 then it's a very, uh, very concentrated brine. Where can you discharge this brine? And uh, nowadays, uh, there are all types of researches going on to see how we can further treat this brine uh, up to a, a situation that you can maybe uh, make the brine uh, uh, salts that you can uh, that you can reuse, and, uh, and 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 that can be calcium carbonate or other uh, calcium salts, but can also be uh, sodium salts. And there, uh, when the water is very concentrated, the brine is very concentrated. 
the uh, freeze, we call it freeze crystallization comes in. Uh, there you can crystallize in, 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 uh, by freezing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, salts further, and then you can separate the water from the salts and uh, make uh, pure salts and also a little bit of water. But uh, it, it, when you look into energy intensiveness, uh, yeah, uh, it, it is very energy intensive to treat entire flows with uh, freeze crystallization, but a very concentrated stream, uh, stream maybe you can uh, treat, and that is uh, yeah, still not a standard uh, procedure, but could be something for the future, yes. Okay, yeah, that's a really extensive answer. Thank you very much. Um, which countries have the best quality of tap water and why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe maybe I can answer that as well. Uh, it is mainly Switzerland, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands. Uh, and the why for Switzerland is easy. The water comes straight from the mountains, so uh, and uh, but they also invest a lot in treatment. Uh, and um, yeah, in, in the Netherlands and Germany, uh, they, we also have this policy of very extensive uh, treatments uh, without chlorine uh, uh, dosing. So uh, this improves a lot the quality uh, because of taste, but what I said, also because of the trihalomethanes that you do, do not uh, use anymore uh, or produce anymore. So uh, these are more or less the countries that uh, are known as having the best uh, water. I think uh, France is also investing a lot nowadays in, in this type of um, uh, uh, pathways, but uh, yeah, they still use uh, a lot of chlorine too, yeah. Okay, great. A uh, few more. Um, okay, I'm translating this one. Um, what are the methods of bioindication and biotesting of the tap water, quality tap water? What are the methods of biotesting? Biotesting bio and bioindication. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah, that is, um, I did not talk about this, uh, but uh, when it comes to pathogenic microorganisms, yeah, and uh, you want to know whether there are pathogens in the water, that is really difficult because our standards are so high that you cannot measure directly. So uh, we use more, the, we call it the risk-based approach. We say we accept that only one person per uh, 10,000 uh, people uh, may be infected by drinking uh, tap water. Infection does not mean illness. It's one to 100 that you get ill and one to another 100 that you maybe die. And so it's one to 100 million uh, to, that you uh, die from uh, tap water. So that is very low uh, uh, risk. But we calculate this risk. And then when you calculate this risk, yeah, what Ono said, yeah, you need to find one virus in a, in, in an, in an, uh, in an uh, swimming pool, Olympic swimming pool. And that is impossible to measure. So what we do is, in fact, this risk-based approach. We know the quality of the source water, and then we calculate what is the removal during treatment. And then we also uh, uh, try to estimate what happens during, uh, during distribution. And this is uh, mainly, and of course, we also measure the E. coli, and, 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 but that is more to indicate that there was a problem with maintenance and operations. But uh, the risk-based approach is the most uh, important part. When it comes to the, uh, the regrowth, we have this uh, regrowth potential measurements. Uh, we call it AOC as well, uh, assimilable organic carbon to see how low the concentration of organic carbon is in the water. So uh, that can be uh, used for bacteria to grow. So these are measurements, but uh, this is uh, maybe going a little bit beyond, beyond uh, uh, this colloquium, I think. Oh, no, yeah. to, to, uh, to add. Yes, you can use indicator bacteria in the laboratory. So you take samples, but as Luke already mentioned, you have to wait for 24 hours or 48 hours. But also there are no new innovative DNA techniques you can apply, and that's uh, you can have your results in a few hours. 
but uh, you have to always take good consideration all the guidelines from the legislation. And they also have something to tell here. Um, the, the, the risk uh, approach is the QMRA, the quantitative um, the QMRA risk analysis. Uh, so several techniques can you apply to test your bio, the, the bio the factors, in fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, then a question uh, from Johan for Luke. Uh, you mentioned using one-stop reverse osmosis. Does this technology need a lot of intermediate cleaning of the membrane? Yeah. Now, what I said, uh, in this case, it was, um, it was uh, a riverbank filtrate. So, in, in fact, it is not totally one step because it is also pretreated already by the, the, the riverbank. And, uh, yeah, and when you keep the water uh, anaerobic, then you don't have a lot of regrowth in your, in your, in your membrane system. So, in fact, if you want to have one step arrow uh, from the river, uh, then it makes uh, it, it is more difficult. And uh, what you should do then uh, work with very low recoveries. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in fact, you, you, you have maybe recoveries of 10% so that you have less problems with, uh, with your uh, biofouling and, and fouling uh, problems. So in fact, yeah, it is not that it is uh, uh, directly possible. Although nowadays uh, there are other developments also in the Netherlands uh, with other type of membranes uh, that uh, that are less prone to fouling. And uh, so yeah, and that is not a role. I think it's more in the in the NF in the nanofiltration uh, uh, mode. But uh, yeah, they, they they at least claim that they need less. Uh, they have less fouling, so they need less uh, 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 cleaning. Yeah, and in fact, if you have a lot of cleaning, then the recoveries become also low, and it and it is uh, rather costly. So yeah, it is not uh, let's say the holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But in this situation, it's possible. No? Yeah, nice. Uh, okay, next one is about uh, some chemical elements. Uh, does the Netherlands have a problem with increased amount of iron and manganese? And yeah, if yes, then what kind of systems of purification yeah. are reasonable in this case? Uh, let, let me take, take that one again. Uh, iron and manganese. Uh, normally occur in uh, groundwater uh, where the water is uh, anaerobic and uh, what I know from uh, from the Netherlands is that we have uh, that every well has a certain concentration of iron and manganese but some wells have higher concentrations and other wells are lower concentrations. Uh, um, in fact, uh, as, as long as what I know is that these wells are more or less constant in terms of concentration. But of course, if if there is not sufficient recharge of your of your um, system, then maybe the iron and manganese can go up. In principle, iron and manganese is, is easy to remove. Uh, uh, you can just aerate your system, then uh, the iron and manganese uh, will be oxidized afterwards in the filter. It's a little bit complex, but but it, it, it works uh, it, it, uh, rather easy. Uh, so you can have iron and manganese oxidation in your filter, and then the, the iron and manganese are removed by the filter too. So you have an aeration and a sand filtration. That should be sufficient. Of course, if there is too high concentrations and the filters clog uh, immediately, then you have to think of uh, more coarse filters. Sometimes we use double layer filters, or sometimes we even uh, use a double filtration system. Eh? So uh, it depends a little bit on how high, but in principle, iron and manganese is not dif uh, easy to remove, of uh, not difficult to remove. Of course, the problem here is uh, what is the reason for the iron and manganese, and maybe that is uh, that is an environmental problem. Uh, so, uh, if if there is, for example, uh, oxidation of your 
of, of your peat layers, etc., uh, uh, and, and therefore there are more uh, anaerobic, uh, system, uh, more anaerobic uh, aquifers. Yeah, that is not what you want, of course. Eh? So uh, the the, perp the the reason is maybe uh, uh, more, more difficult to to understand, but yeah, the treatment is in principle easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Nothing to add. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, then the next one, uh, I'm a little bit scared to ask after the results of your latest regional elections, but uh, still, uh, because it's about uh, influence of farming and nutrients pollution of, of, of groundwater. Of course, you have, uh, uh, it's a very long text in the question, but I will try to rephrase it in the way that everyone understands. Uh, yeah. So you have, of course, massive farming industry, including animal fun farming and, uh, well, since I know the sector very well in the Netherlands, uh, you use quite uh, a lot of nutrients to uh, to really um, ensure high yields out of the hectare because the hectare is uh, the most precious and the most scarce resource that you have, uh, which is like true also for every country. But uh, in Ukraine, for instance, we use much less nutrients. Uh, for one hectare of, of uh, and the problem is but in 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 the Netherlands it is that that we we use I, I think more nutrients than strictly needed because yeah. we have too many animals eh? and uh, well that's yeah, yeah that's, that's that, another uh, story uh, that's another story and this this animals they also produce this nutrients that's, that's it uh, that's, it's, that's, it's, that's, it's, it's, they it's, produce it's, the nutrients yeah it's so, the byproduct they want to get rid of the nutrients and so they they use it for the farming but uh, but yeah. in fact that is a, a big issue eh? for example if we have uh, nitrate eh? ammonium is is uh, oxidized to nitrate and it goes to uh, to the deeper layers, and uh, you you take water from uh, an aquifer that is contaminated with nitrate. It is difficult to remove the nitrate from uh, from from the groundwater, and that that needs an extensive treatment. And that is a pity because normally groundwater is easy to treat. Yeah, the iron and manganese you can easily remove, but the nitrate is more difficult. So what you should do is you should uh, predict. And that's something that happens, I think, uh, in the in the 90s uh, in the Netherlands, we had this growing concentration of nitrate in the groundwater. And then they started to indicate that in cer certain areas, you should not uh, uh, use too many nutrients anymore. So that you, because you can predict where the nutrients come from and how they go to the, to, to, to the, to the wells. So now uh, the concentration of uh, nitrate is more or less constant, going down a little bit. So uh, yeah, what you should do is pre uh, prevent this type of nutrient pollution and uh, being more in harmony uh, with uh, with the environment. And um, yeah, that means that in certain areas you should not uh, use too many nutrients, and in other areas maybe uh, you can uh, use more. But uh, yeah, apart from the nutrients, also uh, agree. Uh, Agriculture uses a lot of pesticides. Maybe uh, I think in the Netherlands we use many pesticides uh, uh, per hectare in, uh, compared to others. Yeah, and that also at the end comes into your groundwater, and that's also difficult to remove. So uh, we are now also in discussion with the farmers uh, how to uh, diminish this uh, uh, amount of pesticides to protect our our precious wells, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, <laughs> is limitation for use of agrochemicals manure more reasonable than uh, like in comparison to the cost of water treatment, water purification? So the, the question was only yeah. economical aspect, but you have basically yeah. answered this question already, uh, saying that it's not only economically more reasonable it's also more reasonable just uh, by common sense and, and yeah environment it, it it's not only about it, it's also about the environment yeah? and, uh, and and you don't want yes. to pollute too much your environment yeah yes that that's true but do you know uh like i know that already uh the government of root and and some regional governments they were already 
putting a lot of pressure on farmers uh, before uh, that they have to really decrease the, no. the the number of cows they have to no. use less nitrates uh, and and phosphorus no. as well uh, but and i uh, think this is this discussion goes beyond a little bit about drinking water supply eh? because yeah, it's, 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 it goes it's also really... We 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 export eighty percent of our uh, meat uh, to elsewhere, and then the question is: Should we do that in this uh, small country? So uh, this this yeah. is a discussion that yeah. is going beyond uh, beyond the discussion about yeah. drinking water supply. But I think the, the the major thing is that if you if you want to uh, keep your environment uh, clean in your drinking water, is not only your sources are not only uh, yeah, in terms of economic things, assets, but it is also the salmon, eh? uh, the salmon in the yeah. in the river yeah. uh, line. Well, that's biodiversity. If groundwater is clean and safe, then it means that your environment is also doing well, and uh, yeah. we have to be more and more in balance with our environment uh, because with climate change, with growing pollution, uh, growing population, uh, growing pollution, yeah, we we have uh, serious problems. I think. Yes, yes, that, but but that's why I want to crystallize this question because for me personally, it's very interesting. You you said in the beginning that in the seventies you were uh, living in Wageningen and the Rhine was dirty, and, and uh, obviously now the situation is better. Uh, I also lived for some years in Wageningen, so uh, I know the area very nice, very well. But um, I definitely. Um, Within this 40 years, uh, you have started to use more chemicals on the fields. The, the, there are more animals in the Netherlands uh, than before. And yet, the quality of your tap drinking water is still high. Yeah. And, and it's still going well. So the question is, uh, is, does this mean that you have learned how to uh, cope with this? Or... Uh, do you see a threat in the near future that if the levels of nutrients keep uh, the same pace, you will not be able to keep the same uh, standard of uh, uh, drinking it, water? I always, I always say to uh, people that ask that, eh, is it a threat for uh, drinking water supply to uh, this all this pollution? And it is easy. Uh, we can make uh, drinking water out of wastewater. And so we can make drinking water out of seawater. We can make drinking water from everything. Only the price go up a little bit. And okay. what, what will happen then, instead of 18 cents per person per day, we pay 23 cents per person per day. Still nothing, but then we can make, uh, we can treat. So in terms of economics, uh, we can, uh, it, is, it is cheaper to uh, improve your dr uh, drinking water uh, supply system than to do all type of environmental measures, but yeah. Uh, okay, okay, then then it's really a story about cost-benefit analysis. What what brings more value to you, export of food products or a cheaper tap drinking water or, and yeah. biodiversity? Yeah. Then, then, yeah. then this is yeah. simple. If uh, it's only economics, then it's easy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Perhaps I can add something. The solution lies, I think, for the long term of all for the young people in Oakry, and lies in the holistic approach. If you you can focus on, uh, you can make drinking water from almost everything. Luke said that's right, and the price will go up. But you have to always there's a more another price you have to pay. That's also waste, increasing waste, and and, and uh, biodiversity and so on. So that's why I said in design slides you have to focus on many criteria you have to face. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example, PFAS, mm -hmm. the, the, the forever chemicals, eh? raincoat repelling for water and heat resistant chemicals we use in our pens and so on, raincoats. So and they end up in the environment, but PFAS can remove very hardly from the, from the water. You can do it with activated carbon, but then you have to reactivate your, your, your granules often and you pay a price in terms of sustainability it's, and so on. So it's, it's so prevention. I completely agree with Luke. Prevention is the best approach. Yeah, like like in everything. So yes. uh, yeah. I wish I wish everyone, uh, like all, yeah. all the governments and countries, could have a <laughs> yes. systemic thinking and holistic approach to things. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I'm interesting that the water companies in the Netherlands 
they play this role. Eh? They go to the to the ministry and they say, uh, "Be aware that uh, that the sources are polluting more and more, and that maybe can affect eh, the, at least the investments in drinking water supply, but also yeah, in 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 the environment." So they play this role. I think that is uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the it's... bird in the mind. Yeah. It, it, it's the power of your openness and collaboration uh, yeah. in the society. So we still will, we still have to, uh, yeah, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you, Anna. Um, there is one question that I missed before, and it was about the rusty pipes. So the problem is in Ukraine is that people use old rusty pipes and the drinking water in them uh, cannot be clean. So it will get spoiled. But then I recall this story about asset management from Ono about the 150 year pipe. So how does this correlate? Is it when I uh, look, lift and look, uh, it's a bit complicated question, but uh, maybe try, I will try an attempt. When I, I look, lift in Wageningen, and I lived in Amsterdam, and suddenly the, the water was not clean from the tap. It was completely rusty. And uh, and I was, what's going on here? So I was looking and uh, there was a uh, certain uh, a valve was uh, repaired uh, close to an old church from the 14th century or so. Uh, there were many activities, uh, but, but um, so uh, if your distribution network is maintained, but also when the pressure is constant. So, and how all the water flows, the directions of the water flow. Eh? In the morning, people consume more water and during the night, less. So, but if you could try to uh, make the, your whole system so constant as possible, so not too many variations, is, and that not the, the flow is running from left to right and then right to left. So the whole, the, whole, the infrastructure the design uh, criteria are really also here really important. And, and of course, the, the, the type of material you're using. So iron can be used, but after a while, uh, yeah, it's becoming rusty and, and, and it's becoming, uh, uh, the surface is really, really rough. So then also the bio, fact, uh, bio growth can, can happen on the, on the, in the insides and also scaling can happen. So that's why uh, increasingly we also use PVC as a, uh, an alternative for, for, for rusty pipes, but you pay a price and it is a, quite an investment. So yeah, it's a bit uh, yeah, complicated. Maybe, maybe you can add on that. Eh? There yeah. are two things to avoid rust in your pipes. Uh, the, the one thing to avoid rust in your pipes, and that's what we all do in the Netherlands too. Uh, that is, um, um, uh, we call it uh, neutralizing your system. Eh? So if we have the, P the right pH in your water, then uh, you don't have scaling of your pipes and you don't have corrosion of your pipes. And that is something that is quite easy to uh, to do yeah, to to yeah. To, uh, to manage, uh, and it, but but it, it needs some calculations. So we should not look only to the pH. We call it, but we should look to the saturation index. If the saturation index is not too low, then you don't have corrosion. If the saturation is uh, index is not too high, then you don't have scaling. And that is one thing. Yeah, to so that's why you can uh, maintain. Uh, even iron pipes for more than 100 years, if you have this right pH all the time. Now, another thing is, of course, if you have very old pipes in the Netherlands as well, we have, I think, in average, uh, the, 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 the age of a pipe is 35 years or something like that. And so you have to replace them. And I can imagine that in Ukraine, the replacement is delayed. And uh, also in the Netherlands, we, in the, in the last years, we did not sufficient uh, work on replacement. So I think we have to increase uh, the, 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 the speed of, uh, of replacement of the pipe so that you can then, uh, for example, what Ono said, replace them with PVC or with other uh, materials, etc. cetera. And uh, that means that there's a lot of investments in the beginning, but uh, yeah, you can spread it over 50 years, these investments. So if you have a bank that are willing to invest, and I can imagine in Ukraine after the war, eh, there will be uh, a, a lot of possibilities for these investments, then you can spread that over, over the years and maintain your system in a, in a way that you have uh, the, the, the perfect quality that you need. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, rusty pipes uh, are not an excuse so not to make the rest part of the system clean and efficient, but rather we have to schedule their substitution. Uh, 
in the future. So thank you very much. And we are- Roman, can I, can I add something? It's a nice yeah. example. Luke was mentioning the pH, so uh, the conditioning of your water. And uh, during my educational slide, you, you saw uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it uh, passed by, but I mentioned aquatic chemistry. And this is also a, a really nice example that students can work on aquatic chemistry, make calculations, as Luke said, and try to find an optimal water quality in relation to your pipes. Oh, yes, that's an interesting idea. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, for all the participants who are coming from universities, I know we yes. have people from universities, so we have people from uh, local utilities. Uh, yeah, and the software is for free. It's called FreeXE. It's a, it's a minor detail, of course, of course, but it stands for pH Redox Equilibrium Calculation. It's coming from the United States. It's a freeware software, and you can, you, you run it, yeah, of course, run it for free, and all is updated frequently. Wow, thank you for this advice. And uh, since we're running out of time, yeah. uh, basically already ran out of time, I'm taking the final question and we are wrapping up. So uh, it's about uh, the ground uh, water, but upper layers in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, or maybe it's even, well, surface water. Okay, it's about surface water in the Netherlands. Uh, do you have uh, systems for monitoring its chemical uh, composition? Uh, if yes, uh, how it, it's organized, how it's being done? Yeah, maybe uh, Ono can say something about this as well. Eh? There's there two things that uh, that we do. On the one hand, we have frequent uh, an analysis of the surface waters, and that the, the the samples go to the to the laboratories, and then they analyze uh, the chemical composition. But of course, you cannot do that on, uh, online eh? because it's difficult measurements in all the pesticides, et cetera, that are in the water, you cannot measure online. So we have also, we call it early warning systems. Yes. And uh, that can be, for example, with fish or with, uh, with biofilms or with uh, insects. And uh, they, they behave differently when the water is polluted. And that is an, is an indication that maybe you should take a sample to find out what is the what, what, what is the pollution. So there are two things. Uh, the one is regular uh, sampling, and the other is the early warning systems yeah. to uh, find out when the sampling is adequate. Thank you. Uh, so that's it, I guess. Uh, guys, I'm really grateful for uh, you that you have joined this morning, despite air raid sirens in uh, Ukraine and Kiev. Um, Thank you very much, Luke and Ono, for joining and contributing your valuable time uh, today. And yes, please uh, connect with us and uh, yeah, let's continue working on. Uh, connect with us. Connect yes, with us. Yes, well. yes, as well. Uh, <laughs> let's continue working on better rebuild of Ukraine after the war and Slava Ukraini. Tot things. Thank you all. Fine enough. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.